Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. As you're turning there, I'm just so excited to preach from this text, one of my favorite Old Testament passages, um, and a privilege to share the gospel to you from a, an unlikely uh, story or unknown story, a rather obscure character in the Bible, perhaps a story that not too many people are familiar with, but the story is a hidden gem when picturing the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. So if you're there, please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And for now, I will only read up to verse 7. This is God's word. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, Elodeber, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And this is God's word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, some say the gospel is like a diamond. And when you hold a diamond up to light, you could see that it has actually many, many facets. And when you put the diamond up to the light through the many facets, you'll see that light shines differently from every shape. And following that analogy, then, one of the gospel facets is this grace-filled message of adoption by God to all who believe. The New Testament speaks on spiritual adoption into God's family several times. One of them was last fall in our series in Galatians, but Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says, He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us, and then one he loves. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. But in the Old Testament, as one scholar points out, adoption actually isn't mentioned all that much, only three times. And in all those three occurrences, it didn't even have to do with Israel. But even though the Israelites didn't have a real word for adoption, the concept of bringing a non-family member into their own was uh, very certainly known to Old Testament readers. Because one of the more classic examples of this concept of adoption is found in this story from 2 Samuel chapter 9 of this man, this teenager really, named Mephibosheth. And we start the chapter by hearing King David ask, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? I I need to set up what's happening here. David is now king over Judah and Israel. King Saul, Israel's first king we heard about last week in 1 Samuel chapter 8, where Israel was clamoring for their first king. He was killed after the battle near Gilboa alongside his son Jonathan. And Jonathan, most of us know, was very close to David. They were best friends, so close that while Jonathan was still alive, he and David made a covenant with each other. 1 Samuel 18, verse 3, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself, and it was reciprocal. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan's covenant with David goes even into further detail that they would care, both care for each other's family, if one of them were to die. 
It was an oath, a binding covenant, because they loved one another. But here's the deal. Before his death, some of us know, King Saul and David, they were rivals. Because God's favor and anointing was now on David and not on King Saul anymore. So King Saul wanted David dead. But after King Saul and Jonathan died, Saul's other son, Ishbosheth, another unique name, quickly became the new king of Israel in the north. And David was made king over Judah in the south at Hebron. But after King, um, and so when David was king over the south, by sheer default, these two houses were at war with each other, the house of Saul and the house of David. But then Ishbosheth, he was then killed. And so the Israelites came to David and said, there, there's no other options for us now. Would you also being king, would you also now be king over Israel too? David then reigned from Jerusalem over both the north and the south in a very united kingdom. And naturally, all those from the lineage of Saul, from his house, and we see this even in modern times, were considered rebels to King David. And usually, if you were from a rival faction, a rebellious house, you normally, history tells us, would be killed off in those days as enemies. But then David said there was that covenant made with Jonathan all those years before. David wanted to honor that oath and care for the family of Jonathan, even though they were technically from the house of Saul, the house of rebellion. So that's why he asks, is there anyone left from the house of Saul that I may show kindness because of Jonathan, that covenant I made? And if we look at the text again in verse 2 to 3, Ziba, this servant from the house of Saul, says, yeah, there, there is one. There's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both of his feet, but there actually is someone left over. And for the sake of context, the Bible keeps mentioning that Mephibosheth was crippled. He was Jonathan's son. Some of us don't know who this guy is, but earlier in 2 Samuel, it says that Mephibosheth was crippled at a young age because after their house found out about Jonathan's death, Mephibosheth's nurse was in such a hurry to leave to escape the oncoming Philistines, she accidentally dropped him. And therefore, he wasn't able to ever walk. So look at verse 4. Finding out about this, the king said to him, Where is he? Well, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabur. That's in the northern part of Galilee. Verse 5, Then David sent and brought him to his house. And was surprised to see someone from the lineage of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, verse 6 says. I, and Mephibosheth, probably just wondering what is happening, he says, I, I'm your servant. And look at the kind words from David in verse 7. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness, not because you're great in yourself, but because of the kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm going to actually go beyond that and restore everything to you. And you shall eat at my table always. And I love the line in response here of gratitude in verse 8. Mephibosheth pays homage and says, what is your, Who am I? What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog? And that's like kind of the worst terminology you could use for yourself. A dead dog such as I. And you guys probably now understand why Mephibosheth would be so scared to be in the presence of David, the king. Because he's from the house of rebellion. Why should King David show favor to this now teenage boy, a crippled person from a rebellious house? Now granted, it wasn't that Mephibosheth was planning assassinations or anything against David, or that he hated him personally. Rather, he was simply quietly living in the north, hiding up there to escape the wrath of the king. But he knew, intrinsic to all of this, I'm from the wrong bloodline. I'm from this rebellion. And I'm going to fear for my life. And so he was, of course, startled by the opposite, this act of kindness from David. Mephibosheth had no idea at this point 
that his now deceased father made a covenant with this king, that they would show kindness to one another's family for the rest of their lives. And because he didn't know this fact yet, he said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth knew it was supposed to be death and judgment, not kindness. But before we go on, hopefully you can see that this story parallels the story of our own journey. And hopefully you're already connecting the dots, our own journey to salvation through Jesus Christ. And that's my first point for us this morning. Number one is that salvation is initiated by God himself. Salvation is always initiated by God himself. Not us to him, but him to us. And adoption starts with kindness shown to us. Not our begging or even our shouts to be adopted. Pick me. Mephibosheth didn't come and say, pick me or please receive me. Not our spiritual resumes before God. And hopefully this is good enough for you to adopt me or us. But it is always God's move towards us. It might feel like it. When we first move, we make the first move toward God. We remember that moment of conversion, some of us. But in reality, it was his Holy Spirit that enabled us to draw near to him, to be regenerated in the soul, even without our own initiation. There's a fancy theological word for that, the monergistic work of God. The Scottish theologian at Westminster Seminary, John Murray, said the grace of God is the only efficient cause in beginning and affecting conversion. That's monergism. It is always and only the work of God. The work of God was predestined from before. We see this again in Ephesians 1.3. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. And so it makes sense. Those who are saved who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ were actually chosen before the world was even formed. But because of sin, the bad news, we naturally come from the house of rebellion, the house of destruction. And the Bible says we were sinners and objects of wrath by default, not simply when we first committed sin. That's not when it all got bad. But in our own nature at birth, we were objects of wrath. And so the statement is true that we sin in life because we're sinners. Not we're sinners because we sin, but we sin because out of the default nature, we are sinners. We naturally act rebelliously because we come from the house of rebellion. Oh, if we could alter Mephibosheth's story to make the analogy even more accurate, we would say that he had his disdain for the king and acted out in rebellion in every fashion. That would actually parallel even more accurately to our state. But like Mephibosheth, we should all have this attitude that we don't deserve the favor and grace of our Lord. Instead, we deserve wrath and judgment. But what did King David say to Mephibosheth again? Verse 7, do not fear. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you everything, and you shall eat at my table always. Not just from, now just from this verse, I have the next two points in verse 7. Point number two is this. Because of the new covenant, kindness is shown to wrath-deserving sinners. Because of the new covenant, kindness is shown to wrath-deserving sinners like us. The covenant David had with Jonathan was the reason behind David's kindness to Mephibosheth, not because he felt bad, because he was crippled, and he didn't have much to go on anymore, but in the same way, because of the new covenant in the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, we have access to this kindness of salvation and adoption into God's family, not because we're extra cute and cuddly or because we have some certain crippling flaw that God had mercy on us, but it was because of the covenant of God's grace does he save you or me. Hebrews 9, verse 15, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, 
so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus declares it at the Last Supper, Luke 22, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus showed kindness towards us by shedding his blood on the cross on our behalf. This is the new covenant God has made with sinners who believe and trust in the Son. And so again, point number two, because of the new covenant, kindness is shown to wrath-deserving sinners. That we say, amen, amen, that this is so. The third point comes from the next phrase in verse 7. And now I'll restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Point number three is this. The God adopts us into his family by grace alone and grants us an everlasting inheritance. God adopts us into his family by grace alone and grants us an everlasting inheritance. King David, he does something so unusual. He not only pardons Mephibosheth for being part of the house of rebellion, and he doesn't stop there and say, okay, just go back to the north in Galilee and stay quiet. I pardon you, go in peace, but if I ever see you again, dot, 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 right? It wasn't like that. But he goes further than that, and he adopts him as his own son and grants him an inheritance that is absolutely unheard of in that context and day and age. I'm sure a pardon would have been good enough to bring such joy to Mephibosheth. If I was Mephibosheth, I would say, you know, Golden Corral, great lunch, and I'm going to head back, and I'm never going to bother you again. That would have been good enough for me. But to be like a son, to be granted an inheritance? Oh, the biblical word of mercy is defined as the withholding of punishment when punishment was justly deserved. Mercy is the withholding of punishment when punishment was justly deserved. Grace is defined as unmerited favor, nothing that we could merit to receive the gift of God's grace. Both were at work in this story. Punishment withheld, unearned, unmerited favor shown as a gift. Mercy and grace. And how does this verse speak of adoption then? Notice the phrase, you shall eat at my table always. You don't eat at the king's table unless you're royalty. And David not only pardoned him, but he made him essentially royalty by allowing him to stay by his side and giving him an inheritance. That is the free act of undeserved kindness and grace. And friends, our greater David, our greater David, Jesus Christ, through him, through faith in him, by trusting not in our own attempts of goodness or morality or any self-righteousness, but a trust in the finished work of Jesus, we not only get pardoned for our sins, we get adopted as children. And we not only get adopted as children, we are granted an everlasting inheritance. First Peter 1, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. And being adopted as a child of God also allows us to be co-heirs with Christ even. Romans 8, 17, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What a weighty, truthful statement. We don't just get some of the inheritance. We join with Christ in the age to come to be co-heirs with the Son for all eternity. I don't know what that will actually look like, but it sure seems undeserving. And I think we'd be happy with just a shack in heaven, to be frank, but co-heirs for all eternity. That's amazing. Rebels now deemed royalty, sons and daughters of the Almighty God. So how did Mephibosheth respond? With temporary joy 
temporary allegiance to King Deep, to King David? We'll look back at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. And then we'll continue on in the narrative. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce, that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. There's that reference again to table and royalty. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, meaning he had a lot of weight and uh, responsibility in the house of Saul. Verse 11, Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. By the way, Ziba, if you read later in 2 Samuel, he really disses Mephibosheth, slanders him before David. He tries to get David to not like Mephibosheth anymore, but even through all of that, and that slandering against him, Mephibosheth stays resolutely loyal to King David. But back to the passage, verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame. In both his feet. Verse 13 is the kicker here. Mephibosheth accepted the king's decree. As one author puts it, not only did Mephibosheth accept the status change, he took him up on these privileges as a son. He actually stayed in Jerusalem. He didn't take it for granted. He ate always at the king's table. Brothers and sisters, that leads us to our final point, number four. Don't accept only the status change, but live in the privileges God has granted you as a child of God. Don't accept only status change, but live in the privileges God has granted you as a child of God, in the here and now. It's not, oh, I can't wait till heaven that I can express all the status change and live up to that. God is inviting you to live up to the privileges now. Our Westminster Shorter Catechism, number four, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace, the answer says, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Mephibosheth could have lived in shame continually as one who could not walk. He was lame, as it says there in the final verse again. He was crippled from a very young age. It was shameful to live this way in that day to not be able to provide, to not really make much of yourself. But his shame was, his shame was covered by the kindness of David. And he wasn't embarrassed by it. He actually ate at the king's table always. Perhaps some of us only want to accept a heady knowledge of status change because we're too ashamed to fellowship with the holy God. We're not holy enough, God, we might think to ourselves. We keep messing up. We see too much sin still in us remaining. We have shame from our past that attempts to cripple us. We hide from God. We hide from other believers because we're too afraid to show what we really struggle with. And it's so interesting that this chapter ends with he was lame in both feet. Because I can say that it encourages me to see that no matter what I feel about myself sometimes, or no matter what the enemy tries to whisper in my ear to condemn me, I can stand confident in my status as a child of God. But also, friends, also be granted the courage through faith that I can approach my holy God in true fellowship and with confidence, with joy and surrender. The surrendering of my shame, my guilt, oh, my vastly imperfect record, and then enjoy, rejoice in the forgiveness, rejoice in his perfect record that is now my record because of faith, to rejoice that his love over me is because he gave himself up for me, Galatians 2.20. But Phibosheth didn't scurry off back to Galilee, but he stayed, he fellowshiped, he reveled in the fact that he was a rebel now deemed royalty. Royalty. 
And then, friends, there isn't any need for us to scurry back to our old ways either. Or as last week said, to scurry back to idols that can never, ever satisfy. Friends, adoption is such a critical part of understanding salvation and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. There's so many of us here today that need to hear that we are cherished as his sons and daughters because of the Son, Jesus Christ, and that covenant he made who mercifully pardons and forgives because of his shed blood, but also invites us to fellowship with him as loved children. And certainly we can think of the great banqueting table and supper of Revelation 19, as we will dine with the king and be so blessed to be invited to share at that table. Friends, the call to action then is to be thankful. Oh, gospel truth always drives us to gratitude to be thankful for this adoption and to live in all the blessing that comes with this new identification. If you stop and pause every Lord's Day Sunday service and look back on the week and say, I don't really see any gratitude in my life, perhaps that we, it's because we weren't rehearsing the reminders of gospel truth. And that what we're reminded of Mephibosheth, and we say, oh God, thank you for that mercy towards a sinner like me. That will always produce grace-driven gratitude. So would you thank God with me, brothers and sisters, having been turned from rebels into royalty by his true and amazing grace and mercy. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Would you forgive us if we have not lived in the privileges of your grace as sons and daughters, that we have taken it for granted? Father, forgive us if we have fallen into the temptation to dine with the world, to dine with the idols that we all encounter. Father, would you restore us to see clearly how great and how awesome it is to dine with you as as your children? to live for you out of response to such kindness, that like Mephibosheth to King David, our loyalty would be exclusively to you and to you alone. O God, help us in our understanding of the great truths of adoption and help us to live out of the wonderful truths of what you have done for us in this great gospel. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.